Um, I got this book recently from Pam. Pam's like my book junkie. Like she, and this one's signed by her husband. Her husband got it for her signed by the author, so I have to give it back. And Wrigley Scott seems to be making a film about her life right now. She had a near-death experience. And so this morning I was working on my sermon, but I picked this up and I just um, pulled out a little piece of it and I wanted to read it to you. And this is what she said about her near-death experience. She said, there I was without my body or any of my physical traits, yet my pure essence continued to exist and it was not a reduced element of my whole self. In fact, it felt far greater and more intense and expansive than my physical being, magnificent in fact. I felt eternal as I always existed and would always have be no beginning or no end. I was filled with the knowledge that I was simply magnificent. Isn't that wonderful? And then she goes on to say, how have I never noticed this about myself, I wondered, as I looked at the great tapestry that was the accumulation of my life up to that point, I was able to identify exactly what had brought me to where I was today. Just look at my path. Why, oh why, have I always been so harsh with myself? Why was I always beating myself up? Why was I always forsaking myself? Why did I never stand up for myself and show the world the beauty of my own soul? Oh my gosh. Like, sermon over, let's go home. <laughs> I mean, that's it, you know, that's it. And the thing is that here it's, you know, speakeasy, we honor all paths, you know, we honor all paths, so we get to read and accumulate and dip into all of these different philosophies and theologies and really get to see that we're all so much more alike than we are different. So um, we had some great singers today. Um, I wanted to tell you that I teach from a book called A Course in Miracles. This is a little cliff notes to A Course in Miracles. And um, today we're talking about joy. And uh, you can't really teach joy without teaching about singing. Your, your spirit sings when you're in joy. And so the two th songs for A Course in Miracles are Row, Row, Row Your Boat Gently Down the Stream, Merrily, 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 Life is But a Dream. And it's such a good tune to remember because it, it really instructs us on how to be in life. Like, just row the next step. Just take the next right step. How gently down the stream. How merrily, merrily, merrily. You know, but we sure mess that up, don't we? So, <laughs> and if, if there was a shorter version of a song based on A Course in Miracles, it would be Don't Worry, Be Happy. Here's a little song I wrote. You know that one? So good. So really, it's so simple. Like, don't worry, be happy. It could be an affirmation that we take with us all throughout the day. So joy makes us want to sing. Um, there's this other song, and there's so many songs written about joy and happiness. You know, I want to be happy, but I can't be happy till I make you happy too. Now that song is actually bullshit. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not responsible for your happiness. You know, if I say I can't be happy till you're happy, oh my God, I've totally myself, right? <laughs> Right? I'm not responsible for your happiness. The other song that came to mind when I was thinking about this was, um, oh, what was it? <laughs> it was, uh, forget your troubles, come on, get happy. We're going to chase all those clears away. Sing hallelujah, come on, get happy. We're headed for the judgment day. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, wow, well, that seems like fun. Let me put my lipstick on for that one. <laughs> Like, is that the most bipolar song in the world? Like, come on, go to get judged. Who wants to go get judged with me? What the hell? <laughs> but that's the way these backwards philosophies seep into our consciousness because they go unquestioned. And we start to build up and be supported in this idea of a judgmental God, and that is heresy. You know, God is not judgmental. So we want to kind of look at these things that really cause us to be happy and the way that we get in our own way. Um, <laughs> it's just an example, again, of our misinterpretation of God. God is joy. God is love. God and love are synonymous. And if we said God is love, we could cease to speak. Like, that would be it. If we just went around saying God is love, we could cease to speak. But you know me. I'm an Irish woman. I'm not done talking yet. <laughs> My husband's been trying to shut me up for, with no luck. So it's not going to happen today, folks. <laughs> so 
so <clears throat> especially not when I got a mic in my hand. So <laughs> I know. So um, so God being love is not in the business of judgment. Let's just accept that. God being love is not in the business of keeping score. God being love is not in the business of authorizing some sort of judgment day. So where do these fears of God's judgment come from? You know, we have this mythology of the last judgment, you know? Gosh, it's horrible. There's nothing more, um, you know, the, the, the last judgment idea is nothing more than this tricky little myth of the ego that's been harshing our buzz since the beginning of time, this last judgment. Like, God, that's like ingrained in our psyche. Like, I gotta measure up because there's gonna be a day when I'm gonna be taken to task. But we see from that woman who wrote that book, she's like, all I saw was my magnificence. That's all she saw was her magnificence. So let's look at it. And according to A Course in Miracles, this, this thing called the last judgment that's so pervasive in our cultural mythology. According to A Course in Miracles, this is so great. This is the great news. The last judgment is not when we're judged by God. The last judgment is when we stop judging ourselves and judging each other. That's the last judgment. We're the ones who judge, not God. Isn't that insane that we forgot that and we put it on God? We're like, I don't know, God's going to judge me. What? So anyway, that's it. But to do, to, to carry this judgment that we carry, it's exhausting. We're not designed for it. Judgment blocks our light. If we're talking about joy, we're talking about light. And judgment blocks our light. Judgment blocks our laughter. Judgment blocks our joy. And we use it. Why do we use it? We want to look at the purpose of judgment. Well, we use it to protect ourselves. Judgment comes from a very low self-esteem. It comes from places of fear. It comes from comparison. It comes from negative ideas that we've absorbed or we've picked up for ourselves. That's all it is. It's these silly little blocks that we've put in our way to prevent us from experiencing true joy. So, and we consider it like an addiction. I consider it an addiction that we tolerate. Like we all have this funny little addiction to judgment. And I would say that most of us suffer from the addiction of judgment, you know? Uh, if they had a 12-step program for that, hi, I'm Warren, I'm a judgeaholic, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, and, and I know this about myself, and I know it about you. Not to judge, but... <laughs> you see, that's just my dis-ease talking. <laughs> because why? Because I'm afraid. We make judgments from fear, we agree with fear, we make these shattered decisions based on lack and belief in scarcity and our need to control. And this doesn't mean that we're not gonna decide things and that we're not gonna cultivate discernment. My teacher back in Los Angeles was Ken Wapnick, and he was the guy that edited A Course in Miracles. He was just a really great guy. And um, he used to say, like, you can have your preferences, like I like vanilla better than chocolate. And that's a judgment in some ways, but it's only a decision if I don't let it steal my peace of mind. So if all you have is vanilla, and I, I don't have to lose my mind over it, you know? So we can have a discernment, but we don't want to give it a judgment, a final call. So we want to look at the, the way to holy decision making, making a decision, cultivating discernment to include God in our decision making. This would be an optimal idea for us. And in my experience with A Course in Miracles, what we're taught to do is just to take everything through the Holy Spirit, to say, what would you have me do, Holy Spirit? You have a bigger picture here. I just have this little perspective. So what would you have me do? And where would you have me go? And what would you have me say? And I'll tell you, the crazy thing is, the Holy Spirit's not invested in you moving mountains today. It's investing in you calling your mom or cleaning your desk. I mean, it's really simple. Make, tell, send that email that you've been meaning to send. Show up and help somebody out. Hold the door open, give a smile. Like, so basic stuff. Like, our path is made easy. And when we are brought to moving those mountains, an army goes with us. I can't tell you how many helping hands showed up today to make this happen. If I knew I was doing it on my own, it would filter and shrink into nothingness. But there takes so many people, and I want to acknowledge them, actually. Carol, could you stand up? <laughs> she makes me want to cry. She's just so awesome, right? And Jim counts the money, and we'll set up the media, and you know the singers, the singers that were here. I mean, it takes, it takes all of us. And the good news is, is that when you're in a community, you have this net to support you as well. You know, Kathy's out there, and we're holding her in consciousness. 
It's nice to know that people have your back who are rooting specifically for you. I mean, that's just a real good blessing to give yourself. So, uh, so uh, the lesson that this idea of you know joy and light comes from is from A Course in Miracles. And one of the lessons it says, <laughs> I am the light of the world. That's one of the lessons. And it, and it goes on to say, who is the light of the world except God's son and daughter? This is merely a statement of the truth about yourself. You are the light of the world. It is the opposite of the statement of pride or arrogance or self-deception. It does not describe the self-concepts that you've made. It does not refer to any of the characteristics which you have endowed your idols. It refers to you as you were created by God. You are the light of the world. That's why Jesus could say to us, like this and greater things will you do, because you are the light of the world. That's the role that we're here to play. A light holds no judgment. When the sun hits the ground, she doesn't say, oh, I'm going to go on the bush and not on the tree, or you know, like we talked about last week, like no poison ivy, I'm not going to give any light to No. Light holds no judgment. Okay? So that's a simple truth. You are the light of the world. The ego, to the ego, this idea is the epitome of self-glorification. So just know that. You know, the ego's going to go, what? Who the hell do you think you are? You are the light of the world. That's blasphemy. <laughs> My ego seems to have some sort of accent there. <laughs> but the ego does not understand humility, mistaking it for self-debasement. Humility consists of accepting your role in salvation. We don't always use the word salvation in our modern time, so you can replace that word with peace. Accepting your role in peace and taking no other role. Okay, so I have a role to play in peace, and the way that I can do that is by shedding light through me. It's not humility to insist that you cannot be the light of the world. It's the function that God has given you. God literally wants you to light up your corner of the world. I think that's audacious. So how do you light up your corner of the world? With happiness. That's how you do it, with happiness. You see a little baby come into a room and they're just like unconditionally happy and the whole room lights up. You know? So we do it with happiness. Can you imagine how great God's love is for you to trust you so much and give you a mission that you're totally able to master? This God has no investment in your judgment and judging you. You know, what good would that do if we felt judged? It would be really hard for us to feel happy at the same time. So the idea is that you cannot outlove God. If you even take a moment right now, because we want to kind of work on clearing that filter. If you take a moment and think about that person that you love to the moon and back, that you love unconditionally, and think of how that unconditional love feels, and then multiply that by a quadzillion, which isn't actually a number, but it was the biggest thing I could think of this morning. <laughs> a quadzillion. That outcome is a shadow compared to how great God's love is for you. I think, that's, I think that's amazing. Like We can't even handle the, the whole truth of God's love. God's love is immaculate. God's love is impeccable, without judgment, because it only sees the perfection and nothing else. Like that lady was telling us, it sees us as magnificent. And I think that it's beyond magnificent, but magnificent is the only word that we have here. Like I think it's beyond words, the way that God loves us. But we've taken up this addiction to fear, and the one thing that we have, uh, the, and to fear, to fear what? To fear the one thing we have no reason to fear, God. That's what we do, we fear God by creating this judgmental God. So some people say fear is forget everything and run. You know, and what is everything? And of course in miracles it says uh, everything is love, right? So when we forget everything, we forget love. When we forget everything, we forget God. And we literally run away from God. We're like run on our own away from God. It's so funny. It's like we're running away from God. And God's like, where are you going? Like, I'm the, I'm the good guy here. I had this really funny story when I was little. I had this crush on Patrick Clayton. Oh my God. Like I had such a crush on him. And we were on the playground and every day I would say something to him to get him to chase me. I'd be like, you're a monster, ah! and he'd go, ah! and he'd chase me, and I'd be like, I'd be running, I'd be like, this is great, you know? <laughs> so we did, we, they had, it was a Catholic school, we had just a gravel pit, like there was nothing, you know, there was no, you know, there was like a faded hopscotch thing on, and they were like, go out and be freezing in New Jersey, be like, God, it was miserable. They were like grooming us to stand on the corner and do nothing, hoodlums, right? So we'd be groomed for. <laughs> Anyway, I would get Patrick to chase me, right? 
And then one day, I'm running from him, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I running from him? I totally love him, right? So like, I'm, I'm running, oh, I'm looking at him, I'm running, I'm looking at him, finally I'm like, <laughs> I totally did that. And he looked at me, he screamed like a girl, and he ran in the opposite <laughs> direction. <laughs> that was so funny. That was so funny. That's still one of my funnier moments, because I think like, I was smart enough to think like, no, I don't want to run from the thing that I want. You know, and what would it feel like to really say, yeah, I do, yeah, come on, let's hug. Let's hug it out, man. Man, I can't tell you, my diary was always written, Dear Patrick, I had six, old, five older sisters and they were always joking on me, whatever. <laughs> so, we fear, we forget, and then we immediately go into judgment, and our judgment helps us to maintain our separate perception. That's what our judgment does. Perception is a limited point of view. Perception means to, perception, like when you're with your camera, you, you start to take, that's you take a perception, you take a picture, you take an idea, you collect it. This is what perception means. To perceive means to take. To, to, but knowledge is not to collect or take. Knowledge is to receive the wisdom of God. To take um, is to perceive, to, knowledge is just to receive. So we can say like, you know, what would you have me do? Let me receive the higher knowledge from me. I don't have to go out there and get it because what I get is going to be limited. You know, so instead of getting, we want to practice letting, allowing, okay? So um, the a uh, ACIM, Course in Miracles, talks about perception versus knowledge. And it says perception is a limited point of view and God is not limited. God knows all, has all, holds all, and to know, uh, to know in A Course in Miracles is to be certain, to be sure. And that's why we can say, knowledge is power. If we want to have power, we got to go to God for that power. It's the one source. Like when it says, like, have no other gods but me, like it's really saying, like, this is the only place that you're really going to get everything that you really want. All you have to do is put me first. So um, perception is to see from a specific vantage point, and perception can change depending on how we feel, right? So that's why it's not to be trusted. Only God knows all. And to know you completely is to love you. To know you is to love you. That's another song. I don't know how it goes, but I know it's a song. Only God can see that you, what you really are. And here in this experience called life, we see each other from specific little vantage points, and we start to judge. Um, we shift and we change, and therefore, we can't really trust that perception. Um, but like knowledge has no opposite. Like love, knowledge has no opposite. We like to think that fear is the opposite of love, but fear is actually the absence of love. So we could say, like, okay, so this is just my perception. This is just when I'm, when I'm in a ragged place and I'm not hung out, I'm, we could say, oh, this is just my perception. It's not real. It's only my limited point of view. It's a fractured version of the story because I don't know all the players that showed up. I don't know if that woman who's flipping me off in the car actually just got really bad news. Like, I don't know anything, you know? So I'm willing to give up my fractured version of the story for the holy story, and the only place I can get the holy version is from God. So here's the steps that we take to go to God for that knowledge. The first step to truth and to knowledge is to, first, to begin to judge everything as perfect, like we say, just the tip. This is perfect. <laughs> Kathy posted that on Facebook, and every time I just the tip, I think it's funny, because it's totally irreverent, but whatever. Um, but, you know, this is perfect. It helps us to remember, this is perfect. That's a, t a holy tip for you. So the first step in truth is to, is to judge everything as perfect. The next step is to be in love with everything. Okay, that's huge. You know, be in love with everything? Yes, be in love with all that is. This is Byron Katie practice. And we might not be there right now, but at least we can look at what are the blocks that are preventing me from being in love with everything, and we go together. And that's how we light up the world. So judgment casts a shadow on the Son of God. It casts a shadow on the situation and where we could instead be bringing light. So we want to ask ourselves today, am I a shadow caster or am I a light worker? And I think you're a light worker. You wouldn't be here in the morning. You'd be in bed thinking about all the people that you want to judge. That's <laughs> where I would be. <laughs> so let's look at the aspects of light and judgment. Light is to bring into visibility.
to illuminate, to shine, to be radiant, to enlighten, to unburden. These are the aspects that come to take it easy. My dad used to always say, hey, take it easy. You know, everybody would come in the house and go, okay, see you later, take it easy. Like, that's a light, a light filled thing to say. To judge is to find fault, to um, denounce, to condemn, to attack, to land base, to rail against, to cast asparagus, to scorn, to give bad press, to run down. Wow. Judgment, when we look at it truly, it's very violent. It's very vicious. So, vi you know, um, fearful people do vicious things. So if we find ourselves in judgment, we could say, oh, I'm afraid of something. What am I afraid of? Let me just look at that and get some healing around it. Wayne Dyer says that when you judge another person, you don't define them. You define yourself. So wouldn't that be a great thing to look at today? Uh, who are you, uh, yeah, so you know, judge yourself. So this, again, this judgment is like a protection mechanism. In AA, they often talk about, you know, when you point the finger, there's three pointing back at you. It's kind of cliche, but it actually kind of works. It helps us to see, oh, this is the thing that I'm not willing to look at in myself. So let's take a moment to just look at that, you know? Let's just take a moment even just to close our eyes for a second and think about that person that we've been pointing the finger on, that we've been taking the hammer down on, that we've been talking sideways about. You know, you know who the person is, they've already come to your mind. <laughs> Rumi says, you know, there's a field where there's no right and wrong, meet me there. And just imagine yourself in a field and see who else comes to that field that you've been keeping outside your heart. So this person is not just your teacher, they're your reflection. I know this is an easy work to do, but if you really want to do this work, um, it will free you. So let's just look at that person, look at them in the eyes and say, you know what, I'm ready to drop this story about you. I don't know how to do it because I have defined you this way since the beginning of time. We have a special commitment to each other to run each other down. But today I want to unburden you because I want to be unburdened. I'm making that commitment and even imagine the Holy Spirit being there between you, you know? And we're just going to know that if we commit to it, we will see miracles. All right, so when you're ready, you can come back into the room. And to support you in this commitment, I'm going to invite you to take it a little step further. I want you to go to a friend that you know, somebody that you really trust, and say to them, hey, my good friend, <laughs> who I really trust. Um, it turns out I'm addicted to judgment. <laughs> and sometimes it's such a blind spot that I don't even know that I'm judging. I'm so committed to my judgment that I can, I can actually run down the street on fire and not even know. I'm so tolerant of my own judgment. So could you do me a favor? Just for a week, just for one week. <laughs> People are already cringing. <laughs> Could you do me a favor for me? Could you hold me impeccable to my word when I you know, begin to comment um, about other people? Uh, because I'm committed to be a light worker. So could you, you know, if you see me you know, starting to run down the road, just say one word for me, okay? Just say blind spot, okay? That's it, blind spot. Let's all say blind spot together. One, two, three. Blind spot, blind spot. right? Okay, that's kind of startling actually. If you're in public and you're talking and somebody goes blind spot, it might be weird. All right, so let's just go with the initials, how about? Let's just do the initials. What are the initials? B.S. Oh, funny. <laughs> funny, isn't that funny? B.S. Hmm. We could just whisper that to you. We could just whisper B.S. B.S. to each other, right? Call me on my B.S., okay? Because I don't want to drag this B.S. around with me. I'm looking at really illuminating my blind spots. That's what a light worker does. So, uh... <laughs> I love that BS thing. Oh my god, that just came to me this morning. I didn't really realize that it was BS the initials, and I was like, that's perfect, Holy Spirit. Anyway. And you can say to your friend, listen, it's one week. I promise not to take it personally if you do this for me. Now, for sure, you're gonna take it personally. You're gonna be like, oh my god, why do you have to keep saying BS? You know? I'm trying to tell you a story. <laughs> Let me just get this damn story out, then you can do your whole BS thing. But no, really, see if you can be impeccable for one week, you know? You can, it's a suggestion. Um, so the Course of Miracles says, I seek, seek not outside yourself for your own happiness, right? 
It will fail you. You will weep each time an idol falls. It goes on to say, seek not outside yourself, for all your pain comes simply from futile search for what you want, insisting where it must be found. Where, what if it's not there? You, do you prefer that you be right or happy? Now you can be. Now that makes it sound like we can only be right or happy. But you can be right and happy if you're in your right mindedness. You're going to be happy. Okay. Um, God's goal for you is happiness. Um, so it's said that if you if you're committed to activating this inner joy, that you'll see a joyful world. We see it because we believe in it. We, we usually say here in this illusion, oh, I'll believe it when I see it. That's not true. We see it because we've believed in it. We are out picturing everything and we have to take responsibility for it. Um, but we could use this world as an experiment, okay? Like we talked about the surrender experiment. We could do a joyful experiment. How much joy am I willing to see in the world? I actually gave that to a client for homework. I said, go get a notebook and go on a scavenger hunt and tell me how many beautiful things and how many joyful things you see in the world. You could do this for yourself. Because if you start to focus on it, it will spring up around you. You could do it with any characteristic of God. You could do it with prosperity. You could do it with um, honesty. You could do it with joyfulness. You could do it with creativity. And if you focus on it, you'll begin to see this world. You're large and in charge in that way. So, um, so seek to be see, seek to see, be, and free joy. If we don't actively seek for the sweetness in life, we are going to be entertaining unwelcome guests, and you know who they are: blame, shame, doubt, resentment, judgment. Like all the whole bad news buffet is going to start to walk in the door, and we'll go, "Well, well, because you didn't choose to seek for joy. You get to do that." When another person makes you suffer, it's because that person is suffering. So just know that. You don't have to take it personally. And his suffering can sometimes spill over. But he doesn't need to be punished. What he needs is love. What he needs is understanding. This is what Thich Nhat Hanh says. This is what A Course in Miracles says. This is where all the roads merge into one. Everything is either love or a call for love. So if we start to judge somebody who's acting out or is extra grace required, we're doing exactly what we're not supposed to do there. Can we stand in the fire with someone and not judge them? Last night I had some, and I want to say hoodlums, but that would be a judgment, in my basement, my son and his girlfriends, um, <laughs> up till seven in the morning. And uh, you know, I wanted to go down there and read in the riot act, but I had to ask the Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? And so I went down in the basement and I was like, hey guys, the gig is up. Like I've been in your shoes, I've done the, the, the you know, drugs all night, I've done the drinking all night, I've done it. Like this is gonna serve you no way. And it's gonna take you nowhere. And if you don't drop it, it's gonna drop you so hard. You know? And they're like, we're not doing anything, we're not doing anything. Like, it doesn't matter. I'm saying this to you because I love you. And I'm like, what do you love to do? And the one girl's like, I'm really good at organizing. But you see, my mom died when I was 17 and I don't really have good mentorship. It makes me want to cry, because she already has a kid. And I go, don't use that as an excuse. My mom died when I was 13, not to like, you know, one up you on the <laughs> victim scale, but I go, if you love organizing, like get to it. Like start to map out your course. Now, you know, when, when I left the conversation, you know, I gave them, I actually hired her to help me clean my office. I'm not kidding. Now the old morning would be like, out, get out. You know, but the new morning was like, how can I support you in waking up? You know, now that does not mean that she's even going to show up for the gig. I can't get caught, off, caught up in thinking I healed somebody today because that story is not over yet. All I can do is do my part. I might be the first straw on the camel's back. You know, there might be a million other that come after me that say, wake up, wake up, wake up. And she might want to continue to fall asleep. Look, it took me a lot of years to crawl out of my own victimhood. But all I know is I can do my part today. That was a total tangent, but you're, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to close up soon, and you can, um, you can join the conversation. So everything is a lesson for us. You know, it's not against us, it's for us. Every opportunity is a lesson or a blessing. We can get something out of this. Of course, Miracles tells me that I'm not going down in the basement to save somebody and put on my cape and be the hero. No, that in fact, there's mutual healing here. You know, that maybe I'm healing that wound from my mom when I was like hanging out in basements and feeling bad about myself. Maybe that's my role here. I don't know. We don't know what anything is for. But all I know is I, this is not just me saving you. God does not bring two people together to only help one. Okay? So let's not put ourselves on pedestals. Okay? Um, so 
Here's another tip that you're gonna hate me for that I want to invite you to do today. <laughs> When you notice yourself beginning to complain or judge, stop right there and say to yourself, I am so grateful about this thing that I'm gonna complain about. So you might say, I am so grateful for having hoodlums in my basement. I wonder what this is gonna be for me. I am so grateful for you know my friend crabbing at me for not cleaning off the kitchen table. I am so grateful for nobody feeding the cat today. It makes me appreciate that, you know, we we have cats and that, that they're hungry. And this shows me like, you know, that uh, things need to be cared for. It's a great classroom. Everything is a blessing and a lesson. Just try and activate gratitude around the things that you want to complain about because if you do that, you won't need your friend to call you on your BS. You'll you know you'll you'll segue that. So what you get from this practice of, of calling yourself, of getting into gratitude, I don't really know because I haven't really tried it yet. <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. I mean, I'm sure I do it in certain ways, but I haven't really committed to it. So we're going to be walking this together. But I do know that gratitude shifts the energy around things. And I like to say everything is everything and everything is love. Everything is everything and everything is love. So if I come up against this place that's making me feel jagged and ragged, I can go right there and say, wait, there's love here that isn't revealed, that I'm not able to see. I have a blind spot to it. So let me see what's behind it. And God goes with us in this discovery everywhere we go. God goes with us, helping us to hold and shine the light. So it says, it says in A Course in Miracles, uh, when you meet anyone, 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 remember that this is a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. Can I get an hallelujah amen on that one? Amen. Yeah, seriously, right? I'm going to post that on our Facebook page. You know, it's, it's the truth and the whole truth. Like, if we use this as a compass, how am I treating you? This is how I treat myself. Like, if I was to go down the basement and re read them the riot act, where am I reading myself the riot act, you know? Where am I not coming gently to the program, you know? So it's said that the second coming of Christ isn't going to come to us. It's going to come through us. That's audacious. This light of Christ consciousness wants to shine through us. We're each a part of that consciousness today. So we have to do our best to really allow ourselves to hold the light. So we want to go on to this week. We want to become the light. We want to activate laughter. Laughter is so important. We want to see who can be the happiest calling card for God. <laughs> Why not? Why not play that game for yourself? Um, laughter relieves stress. It, it, oh, I haven't said yet. So we take we have an improv class going here, and uh, we have some people who are in the improv class. We laugh our asses off every Monday night. We completed this Monday coming up, but we have so much fun there that we've extended it for four more weeks. So if you're invested in having some laughter, you can join us. I think it's like 150 bucks, four weeks. And we say yes and, and we cultivate you know spiritual little spiritual practice. We have praying and all that. And um, we have a blast. So that's a fun thing to do for your soul, to you know, learn the tools of improv, because it will help you navigate the world in a playful way, not get hung up. So the Course in Miracles says that all separation begins when the Son of God remembers not to laugh. That's how important laughter is. We, you know, um, that's the moment when we hand over our joy and we grab for judgment. Right there. We hand over our joy. I don't want joy. I want judgment. Thank you. Please. Another serving, please. I love it. <laughs> but it's time to give the throne back to a much gentler ruler, laughter, you know? Uh, so, you know, when we take it personally, when we take it seriously, when we judge instead of enjoy, that's where we're getting on the triangle. And of course, miracle says, like I said to you in the beginning, we've been given a million reasons to gladden ourselves. Look at us, we're in freaking Hingedale. You know, we have Starbucks quality life. Many of us have many pairs of shoes in our closets. Like, what the hell are we not happy about? Will was telling a story this week. He was on the um, set of JAG, and there was this guy, you know, the main actor. I won't mention any names because I can't remember him anyhow. And, um, <laughs> And he, you know, making buck, doing what he loves, you know, having people just like kowtow to him, what can we get to, what can you get, are you happy? Miserable, like miserable. But, you know, that's a reflection of us too. I mean, we really have magnificent lives. We have so much to be grateful for. I want to read one little story and then I'm going to turn it over to you. 
That was BS. Thank you. Total BS, man. So this story is about another near-death experience. I thought it was interesting to start off with one and end with one. I didn't plan that, but I think it's interesting. And this one is called um, Finding Joy in the Little Things. Uh, this was from a woman named Kimberly Clark Sharp. She wants to experience an interest, share an interesting near-death account of a life review. So it's not a judgment. It's a life review that sometimes happens when we trans transition. And the lesson the woman learned from reviewing her life is that our actions, which sometimes seem so unimportant, can be more important than we can ever even imagine on the other side. When this woman was a little girl, she saw a teeny little flower growing out of a crack. And she bent down and she cupped the little flower and she gave it her full, unconditional love. And she just allowed herself to just delight in it and enjoy it. Now, when she had her near-death experience during her life review, she realized, she discovered that this one incident with the flower was the most important event of her entire life. Isn't that incredible? The reason is because it was the moment where she expressed love in a greater, pure, and more unconditional manner. It shows in a dramatic way the principle that appears in many life reviews. The principle is that the actions we think are unimportant may turn out to be the most important things. Like think about It's a Wonderful Life when the, you know, the angel comes and does the basic thing and then you know, all of these things unfold from just one act of kindness. So unconditional and spontaneous acts of love are the greatest acts we can perform, even if it's directed at a little teeny flower growing out of a crack. You know, that's so beautiful. Uh, Rumi says, when you do the things from your soul, you feel a river move you in full joy. And I wanted to just close one more time with, you know, this isn't big stuff. It feels big, but if we just row, row, row the boat gently down the stream, we will be inspired to be merry and merry and merry and recognize that this is such a dream, you know? It so quickly fades. We're only here for a temporary time. And so let's see who can love the most, to give the most, you know? And see what happens. See what happens. Alrighty, the kids are gonna sing us a song. <laughs>